Welcome, friends and foes, survivors and killers. I sit around the campfire together and talk about Dead by Daylight. Specifically, about possibly my new favourite killer. And certainly the only killer ever to contend with the plague in terms of how much I enjoy playing them. Charlotte and Victor Dehigh, better known as the Twins. Anyone who has heard me talk about these killers in a prior video, has watched any of my streams, followed me on Twitter, which you should all do by the way, or has ever spoken about the twins in my general vicinity, will know just how enamoured I am with these two. I get a lot of shit for it, but I truly think they're wonderful killers in more or less every regard. Look, I know their launch chapter, Binding of Kin, released with an inexcusably high amount of bugs, many of which took months to fix and some of which are still in the game to this day. But I have to hand it to behaviour. Everything about this chapter was undeniably high concept, and I think despite its teething problems, what it actually gave us in the long run was pretty excellent. 
I shouldn't need to tell this channel's avid viewers about how brilliant Elodie Rokoto is as a character. If I remade my most popular video about who would be DBD's main protagonist, LED would probably be at the top of that list, and the new perks that were introduced all managed to hit that sweet spot between meta-defining and totally useless, that perk design can often struggle with. They're fun and useful on certain builds, playstyles and killers, but they're far from the kind of perk you're going to get bored of seeing every game. But the defining part of Binding of Kin, and the big reason many people dislike the chapter so much, is the duo of killers feared by solo survivors and salty streamers around the world, the Dehai twins. Charlotte Dehai and her brother Victor are not particularly well liked, partially because of the aforementioned hurricane of bugs that came with their release, and partially because their detractors, many of whom would happen to be some of this community's biggest names and loudest voices, would have you believe that all they're good for is camping hooks. This has led to a vicious cycle where people only play them to camp hooks because that's all they think the twins are good for, reinforcing the idea that all the twins can do is camp because that's all anyone ever seems to do. Fortunately, I'm not one of these detractors, and anybody who has watched my streams or my highlight games from them before can hopefully at least understand why I like playing them so much. Nothing else in Dead by Daylight has ever been able to do what the twins can do by being in two places at once, and that allows for plays and strategies that no other killer could even think about trying. In that regard, they're much like my other favourite killer, the Plague, in that there's nothing else in the game really like them. They are absolutely, brilliantly unique. They're so incredibly different from everything else DBD has ever had before or since that I slowly grew to love them. I can forgive their teething problems on launch and a couple of hiccups with their power, because the strategies and schemes you can come up with, the moments you get when you're playing two people at once, set them apart as something truly special. And it isn't just their gameplay that's so innovative. The aesthetic design and story behind the twins is one of the most unique designs, arguably the single most unique design, behind anything in Dead by Daylight. Nothing like the twins has ever been made before and nothing like them will probably ever be made again. Charlotte and Victor represent a massive step forward for behaviour as a company that makes art. A step away from designs that pay homage to or derive from existing tropes, characters and conventions, in favour of brilliant originality and having the guts to embrace DBD's world as more than just a retelling of horror stories that we've already seen. But before I jump headfirst into what makes the twins so good, I should probably go over the basics of their story. There's a lot to go over, so I don't want to spend too much time on it, but it is important to get some perspective before I get ahead of myself. Okay, let's go. Charlotte and Victor de High were born conjoined together in pre revolutionary France to a single mother, Madeleine de High. We don't have any exact dates for the twins' timeline, but we know they were born in the 17th century during the early reign of the House of Bourbon, the last family to hold the throne of France before the French Revolution transformed France into a constitutional democracy, with the help of longtime friend of the channel, Monsieur Guillotine. And let's just start off by saying, I can't think of a more miserable existence to be born into than that of a French peasant under the Bourbon Regency. There's a reason the French Revolution got so murdery. Because the people at the bottom of that society were treated quite literally lower than animals. The serfs, commonly known as villains, who worked under the French nobles, were bonded to the estates and land they were worked on from the day they were born till the day they died. Other than being allowed to earn money, they were effectively enslaved to their local lords, and their lives were completely expendable. This was the life that Charlotte and Victor were to be born into, and their birth as conjoined twins made the promise of a harsh life even harsher. Due to how unbelievably rare conjoined twins are, much less ones that survive childbirth, we don't actually have a precedent for how conjoined twins were treated back then, especially with the high infant mortality rate back in the 17th century. But what we do know about these so-called monstrous births is that the women who gave birth to conjoined twins in those times were often smeared as witches, giving the mistreatment of the Day High twins a strong historical precedent. Madeleine spends Charlotte and Victor's infancy on the run, caring for the twins on her own before sickness forced Charlotte to become the family's primary caregiver at only five years old. Using baggy clothes to hide Victor, Charlotte would steal food from the nearest town to support the trio. 
but after a short time, the townspeople cottoned on to what was going on. With Charlotte and Victor forced to watch, Madeline was burned at the stake by the people of the town. To the twins, that was everything to them. They had nothing left once their mother was gone, painfully killed in front of them at probably less than 10 years of age. And as they were sold to an organisation of cultists in black cloaks, both of them started to harden. Whatever innocence of childhood they once had, snuffed out like a candle. We learned from Elodie's law that this cult, the Black Veil, worships the entity and offers up human sacrifices to it. And it was at this cult's mercy that Charlotte and Victor spent the remainder of their childhood. They were the subject of experimentation and rituals until, after an undisclosed amount of time, the Black Veil attempted to sacrifice the twins to the entity. But Charlotte and Victor had other plans. Charlotte, desperate to protect Victor, rolled them out of the way of the blade, while Victor, incensed by the attack on him and his sister, lashed out with a candelabra and set fire to the Black Veil sanctum. In the confusion, Charlotte ran, and choking on smoke and with a sting of ashes in her mouth, she escaped the Black Veil. But Victor didn't. Whether it was the cultists, the smoke, or the stress wasn't made clear, but the twin struggle to escape cost Victor his life. This right here is the deciding moment of Charlotte's entire future. She could have tried to get Victor cut away and move on with her life. Her mother and brother, all she'd ever known in the world, were gone and it was just her now. But after all she'd been through, all she'd lost for the crime of being born, what could her life give to her that it had not already taken away? No, she wouldn't move on. She wouldn't leave Victor or his memory behind. She lived her life much like she did before the Black Veil entered her life. On the run, scrounging for scraps of food where she could. Except it wasn't just angry townsfolk that were after her. The Black Veil wanted her too, and their constant harassment would prove to test Charlotte's mettle as a killer. As she grew into adolescence and beyond, Charlotte began to leave a trail of bodies in her wake. Sometimes, they were people she tried to steal food from who fought back. Other times, they are Black Veil members who were hunting Charlotte before finding themselves the hunted. Her strength wasn't gifted to her by the entity, she earned it through years of survival on her own. Under attack by everyone she encountered, but even Charlotte Day High has her limits. One frigid winter's night, Charlotte was at the end of her rope. The Black Veil was closing in as the freezing cold gnawed at her. She'd given up, she didn't know or care what would kill her. All she knew is it would be over soon, and that was good enough for her. And then Victor came back. Something brought Charlotte's long dead brother back to her. We know now that it was the Entity's intervention. He tore free of her chest and ran through the woods with Charlotte in pursuit. He chased a black hooded figure into the thick bank of fog, and once Charlotte had followed him in, the Entity had claimed the twins for its own. And that leaves us where we are now. Charlotte and Victor de High, reunited at last and in many ways, finally free. To the survivors and even many of the killers, being trapped in the Entity's world is a life sentence, but not to the twins. Their lives so far have been so indescribably miserable that the Entity's realm becomes a respite for them. They finally have somewhere they're not looking over their shoulder. Somewhere they can just keep to themselves without living on the lamp. It's not exactly home sweet home, but they've never really had a home in the first place, as sad as that is. And their motivation to kill in the Entity's service is just as grim. They don't kill because they enjoy it, or because they fear the punishment of the Entity, but simply because they have no reason not to. Since the death first of Madeline and then Victor, Charlotte has all but given up on the world and on humanity. Aside from her closest family, Every single person that Charlotte has ever met has wanted to hurt her. Her heart has hardened to the point of nihilism. If other people don't care about her and only want to harm her and her brother, why should she give a shit about what happens to them? Why shouldn't she spell their blood in self-defense, in defense of her brother? Protecting him is the only thing that gives her life purpose. So that's why she's okay with serving as a killer. Because it keeps Victor safe. That's such a unique motivation that could only occur about 
by making a two-person killer. Charlotte and Victor only care about one thing in the world, each other, and they will do anything to make sure nobody ever hurts them again. That is not a story that would have worked if the twins weren't a two-person killer. If Victor wasn't part of the twins, then Charlotte's motivation wouldn't make sense, and vice versa. Clearly, the concept behind the twins was something Behaviour put a lot of work into. They're technically incredibly complicated, and their lore explores themes of family, hatred and despair in a similarly complicated and thoughtful way. And you can see this in even the most fundamental parts of their design. I've been taking a look at the initial inspirations behind DBD's killers, and I've noticed that almost all the original killers fall under one of a few broad umbrellas. Some killers are based off folklore or mythology, such as the hag being Behaviour's take on the witch classic mixed with Creole voodoo, and the huntress inheriting the mantle of the Baba Yaga. Others are based on established horror conventions and tropes that Behaviour has reimagined, such as the trickster embodying the modern murderous artist and the plague being the closest that we're ever going to get to a classic Egyptian mummy. Others still were based on real life killers, either general concepts heavily grounded in real life such as the nurse and the death slinger, or specific people, like the doctor being based on the Chinese doctor Yang Yongxin. And this doesn't even cover the specific homages that a few killers make to individual horror characters, such as Trapper and the Hillbilly, being obviously inspired by Jason Voorhees and Leatherface respectively. If you group all the killers like this, you can see that almost every original killer fits into at least one of these categories, but you might notice one particular absence, or should I say, two. If you want to know more about individual killers and their inspirations, then you can either look back at my old deep dives to find ones I've already done, or take a look at this video by Ajimov where he briefly goes over the rough inspirations of every killer in the game. The twins don't really have a counterpart in popular horror culture or history. They're possibly the only killer I can say that about. Don't get me wrong, twins have been a feature of horror for ages, most memorably in films like The Shining, I'll exploit the uncanny valley effect of two identical people functioning as supernatural extensions of each other. And yet Dead by Daylight's twins aren't identical. In fact, they're defined by what makes them different from each other. Charlotte is big, quiet and emotionally dependent on her brother, while Victor is small, boisterous and physically dependent on Charlotte. They're formerly conjoined twins who later became separated, but seek to maintain their union and family bond which is a really unique concept that hasn't really been seen with twins in popular culture all that much. The only two instances I've seen of horror coming close to this are the X-Files episode Humbug and the 1982 cult slasher flick Basket Case. The X-Files episode concerns itself with a conjoined twin that wants to leave his dying brother behind and bond with somebody else, while Basket Case covers two vengeful twins upset about becoming forcibly separated until they eventually come to blows. In both cases, the stories primarily concern themselves with the divide between the larger twin and the smaller one. Their physical separation ultimately leading to emotional separation with violent consequences. But Charlotte and Victor couldn't be more different from that. While our separation was unwilling, much like the twins in Basket Case, this doesn't push them apart. Their body language and behaviour in the game highlights that they are still as much of a duo as they ever were. Being separated by the Black Veil upon Victor's resurrection, didn't split the twins up emotionally, but instead just gave them more ways to express their cooperative and symbiotic natures. Victor has given more physical freedom through the process, but instead of using it to escape and live his own life, he uses it to help his sister out in the trials. And during the several years Victor spends dead, Charlotte spends the entire time where she could have removed Victor and lived her own life in grieving because she can't live without him. In effect, she has the opportunity to detach herself from Victor and become her own person, which makes it all the more remarkable when she turns it down. This is one of the big things that makes the twin story so brilliant. You don't get the sense that either of them are flat characters because their personalities support and complement each other. You can't tell the story of Charlotte without Victor, and vice versa, but that doesn't come at the cost of making their characters feel unique and whole. This is mirrored by their physical appearances. Victor is small, wiry, and has inhuman features that reflect how the entity returned him to life, such as his third eye. Meanwhile Charlotte is big and beefy, grown strong from the weight of carrying Victor in her chest, 
and everything both siblings owned in the world on her back. Where Victor discarded his humanity, Charlotte retains many human trappings, such as her ragged clothes and her travelling pack, which even has a tea set and two cups for the pair of them. The two distinct people, sharing not just their lives, but their story. And there's nothing else in Dead by Daylight quite like it. The killers in this game are generally defined by how fiercely independent they are, who for one reason or another, who have rejected society or have been rejected by it, and so walk the path of a killer alone. The only time before the twins that the idea of a killer thriving on companionship and cooperation had ever been explored before was the Legion. But like a lot of people, I'm a little disappointed that they didn't do more with a killer whose primary design tenet is that there are four different people sharing one moniker. A lot of people found the Legion's eventual integration into the game to be a bit of a letdown, because they didn't deliver on that super interesting concept in the game. In no way does the power or gameplay leverage being four distinct people in any way that matters, to the point that it's largely reduced to run and stab. Instead, their multiple identities could only really be seen in the Legion's lore and cosmetics. Which is a pretty interesting design decision, but one that understandably leaves a lot of people underwhelmed at what the Legion is compared to what they could have been. Say what you will about the gameplay patterns of the twins, but when played properly, they really deliver on the fantasy of being two people working together in tandem. Charlotte and Victor play distinctly enough from each other that neither is a strict downgrade over the other. Charlotte is slow and purposeful, capable of doing the dirty work that Victor can't, like breaking pallets and hooking people that Victor doesn't have the brawn to do. Meanwhile, Victor's innate aggression and small size allow him to more actively pursue survivors with some degree of stealth. But those same attributes prevent him from breaking pallets or generators or hooking people, and leave him vulnerable to being counter-attacked by the survivors. Neither is a straight upgrade over the other, they're two distinct characters who operate together as equals to leverage their unique strengths together, and a good Twins player knows how to make the most of it. That's why I love playing them so much, and I think why I get a lot of people watching my Twins games on stream or when I upload them to YouTube. Because, like them or not, you've got to admit the creative breathing room in a power like that is unrivaled. I excuse the bugs or oversights or whatever it is that comes with a power as flexible as the blood bond. Because I have no doubt that making a killer that's effectively two people at once is incredibly technically challenging. Especially when you also have to balance something as versatile as Victor and all the interactions that he does or does not have with every object and mechanic in the game, including Charlotte. But if living with a ton of bugs until they get fixed is the cost you pay for such a weird and wonderful killer, that's a price I'm happy to pay. Don't take people who call this chapter a cash grab seriously, because the twins are the highest concept killer Behaviour has ever made. If they were lazy, they'd have picked a simple character to make in the first place. No. A Binding of Kin was so riddled with bugs and design issues, because the twins were so complicated to make. And yet Behaviour made them all the same, so they could really deliver on the power fantasy of playing two cooperative people at the same time. To succeed where Legion failed and create a true multi-person killer. The twins were constructed from the ground up to fulfil that fantasy, and in doing so, became the best thing a killer can possibly be in this game. Unique. In a game where the last four killers have been Plague Without a Soul, Hillbilly without everything that's interesting about the Hillbilly, Knock Off Huntress and Knock Off Knock Off Huntress, the twins stand out as being something genuinely special and their lore and character merge this seamlessly into their gameplay. Nowhere is this more obvious than in the twins' mores. Yes, they do have two. While Victor is out and about, Charlotte takes care of business on her own, and she does it brutally, efficiently, and without a shred of emotion. She's doing what she has to do to survive, and her primary goal is making sure that you're not getting back up to mess with her or Victor ever again. But with Victor on hand, the Mori becomes almost warmer, as the eager little man can't help but get in on the action too. After disabling them, Charlotte tags in her brother and Victor tears away at the back of their neck and head with wild abandon. That little shared nod and tiny grunt of affirmation as Charlotte lets Victor finish them off is surprisingly wholesome out of the context of killing someone. 
after all these years first on the run and then separated by Victor's sacrifice, the Dehai twins are back together at last. Charlotte and Victor represent a great step forward by behaviour in how they design original characters. Their story is cohesive, mirrors their gameplay, and doesn't rely on tired genre tropes and stereotypical characterization to express who they are. Everything about them screams bold creative decision, and you've got to give some respect for that, even if you don't like the way they play. And if, like me, the precious few twins mains left on this world add more survivor players than you think, you actually like the twins gameplay too, then even better. Why do you think I made a 14 minute video about the upcoming PTB twins nerf? Which you should definitely watch by the way, because that nerf is horseshit. I made it because I care about them a lot. And I want to make sure that putting in those galaxy brain plays or clutch long range pounces into practice stays as fun as it can be. And thanks to the responses I got to that video, I'm happy to see that you want to see that too. So in conclusion, the twins are great and I love them, so please behaviour, don't let the PTB nerf go through. The twins are a wonderful killer, and I want this video to be a celebration of them rather than an obituary. They're unlike anything else in Dead by Daylight, and that makes them beautiful, so I don't want to see them forgotten. When this channel hits 20,000 subscribers, I have a special comprehensive twins guide planned out, in a similar fashion to my 10k sub plague guide I made a little while ago. So for people who like that guide and want to hear about my experiences with the twins, please stay tuned. If you like the video, do be sure to give it a like or even subscribe, it would mean a lot to me. Or you can just comment about how cool my hair is. If you want to hear more from me, you can join my Discord. We have a wonderful little community and we're always welcoming of new, new faces. And you can follow me on Twitter as well. I stream on Twitch twice a week, Wednesdays and Sundays at 7.30pm GMT. And if you really want to support what I make and keep the content flowing, you can check out my Patreon and Ko-fi pages as well. The links to all these are in the description, so please do take a look. That's all from me, so be sure to bully behaviour into saving the twins, and thank you so much for being here. Au revoir.